So thank you, Juliana, for the nice introduction. Thank you all for coming this evening here. And in the next 15 minutes, I would like to talk about what we are doing in our technical university in Munich, where I'm working right now. It's a group of supramolecular chemistry under the supervision of Professor Bruco. So I would like to answer you in the coming minutes these three questions. What is supramolecular chemistry? How does nature use it to create complex and functional structures? And finally, how does supramolecular chemistry could benefit from it? So, supramolecular chemistry is a relatively new topic in chemistry. It was just defined in 1969 by John McGillan as the chemistry beyond the molecule. And even though being like a quite relative new chemistry, the topic has been already awarded two times with the Nobel Prize of Chemistry. <coughs> the first time was in 1987, and the other one was just recently in 2016. But coming back to this beyond the molecule, what does actually mean? To know or to understand what beyond the molecule means, we need to know a little bit about molecular interactions. So, just I will show you here the water molecule, one of the simplest molecules that everybody knows. And this molecule is made out of oxygen and hydrogen atoms. So these two atoms are connected by covalent bonds. And which means this for us? Covalent bond means that uh, these two atoms are actually sharing electrons on the outer shell. And this electron sharing makes this bond extremely, extremely powerful. So for our purposes, I will just consider these covalent bonds non-reversible. But these are not the only interactions who sustain together with the water as we know water. So water actually is made out of a network of water molecules, and these water molecules are also interacting with each other through other kind of interactions, which we call non-covalent or supramolecular interactions. The difference between these two basically is that the non-covalent interactions are really, really weak. So these interactions are continuously formed and breaking form and breaking in this network of molecules. And this allows the water, the water molecules getting in and out of this network of molecules. So although when these interactions are isolated are relatively weak, as soon as they combine together, they could form a really amazing and complex structure. And this is actually what supramolecular chemistry cares about. We try to study why does molecules like to come together, and why these molecules, on how these molecules self-assemble and form like more complex structure, and of course, what we can do out of these complex structures. So, just to bring you more into the topic, I will show you an example in nature, because nature uses every version of molecular interactions. So instead of water, I will just show you here another molecule, which is called phospholipid, but it's not so important for us. For now on, we will call them building blocks. What is important for us is that this molecule has two different parts. The red one, which is the head, and is attracted to water and the white one, which is the one that repels the water. So what happened actually when we tried to dissolve these molecules in water? So what happened is that the uh, part that is repelled by the water will try to look for similar parts, while the red head, which is attracted to water, will point towards the solution. So we form a kind of this bilayer, like the one you can see on this slide. And it's just remarkably uh, important to say again that this structure is just formed by non covalent, which means weak interactions. And this allows the molecules in solution to go into the assembly and the other way around to get out of the assembly. Because of this, our materials made out of this approach are endowed with really dynamic properties. And this is really important for nature because this bilayer, for instance, can grow larger and form, for instance, the uh, cell membrane. The cell membrane requires to be extremely dynamic, so the cell membrane needs to adapt when a change around the cell happens. And just imagine that one of these molecules, for instance, gets damaged. Because all of them are moved by non-covalent interactions, weak interactions, the damaged molecule can just get out of the assembly and be replaced by a new and a better one. If this kind of structures will be moved by covalent interactions, the strong ones, this will never happen because we require a lot of energy and we just disrupt the whole structure. So, when nature cares about something, it's because it's really important. It's a process that it has been optimized for billions of years, which means it's kind of perfect. And we, as a scientist, also try, always try to mimic nature into our synthetic materials. So we actually care about the properties of these molecular materials because we consider they could attack 
some properties that they are not uh, compatible with complex materials, and which one they are. So basically, because they are made up of reversible interactions, they are considered dynamic, and they could do such and such, such fancy things, like defect correction, because they are made out of small molecules, they are also easy to recycle. So just imagine that one of these materials will end up in our body. If it's made up of simple molecules, small molecules, it's going to be easier for our body to recycle, to digest them, than if we just inject like a whole huge molecule in our body. And because of the same reason, they are also easy to synthesize. And of course, company always care about money and the easy release, the better release for our material. So how do we do these materials in our lab? So what we actually do is just design this brick building blocks. Uh, let's call it red building blocks from now on. And the key part about these building blocks is like when we put them in water, they don't like to stay in water. They rather like to recognize each other and self assemble <coughs> forming these kind of structures, for instance. And actually, these materials have been already proved to be successful in so many applications. One of them, for instance, is as a solid support to perform reactions. And what does it mean? It's like I can encapsulate here inside some reagents. And it has been proved that the reaction inside this kind of materials happen faster than if I could be just a reaction in solution. What else? In a similar way, we can also encapsulate here drugs and control the release of these drugs. And they can also be really useful for tissue engineering. So if we have an injury, for instance, we can just apply the gel, sorry, this material in the middle. The material allows the cell growth to. And this means that the healing of our bone would be much faster than if the material is still present. So, these materials, as I already mentioned, they are dynamic because the yellow molecules go in and out of the solution. But still, once we form the material, the macroscopic structure, the macroscopic properties of this material are kind of stable once I form the material. So, during my Marie Curie project, I was wondering if we can make these materials a little bit more smarter. Meaning that, can I create and destroy this material on demand? Uh, basically means I will create a material for a specific function, and when this function is strong, the material is just will disappear or will vanish. So can I have actually temporal control of these materials? And for this approach in our lab, we use what we call dissipative supramolecular material. Just to make it easier, DSM. And how do we do this? So here is the slide that I already show you for a traditional supramolecular material. But in our case, we start a step behind and synthesize instead of the red bricks, the blue ones. Which is the characteristic of these blue ones? They like to stay in work, so they don't mind. They don't like to recognize each other as a possible. When we put them in solution, they will just stay there. But what happened when I fill this system? That these building blocks, the non-active ones, become the active ones. And when they become the active ones, they don't like anymore to stay there, and they're just self assemble and form the material that was put in for. But what is important now here is that I can always suppress the additional fuel, and my material will just come back to the initial building position, releasing waste and also dissipating energy. And this is uh, the part where the name of our materials came from. So what I have right now, I have temporal control of my materials because the material will be just present as long as the fuel is present. But also important, I have the possibility to recycle the initial new building blocks. So in this way, I can add a new batch of fuel and repeat the cycle again and again and again. This is really good in terms of efficiency. So in our lab, we try to design different molecules over here in order to control the structure over here. We can do things like long and tunnel fibers, shorter fibers, droplets, and so on. And what we do then with these materials, I will just show you now, two examples that we developed in our lab. First of all, we tried to work with temporary hydrogels because we saw that maybe that could be an interesting application in terms of temporal control. So imagine I could uh, just encapsulate a drug inside one of these gels, put it below my skin, and let the drug to be released uh, according the destroying of the material. So 
If I can control how long this material will stay there, I can also control how long the drug release will be. So here is just an example. Initially, I have everything in solution. I fuel my system. I form the material that I want. And because the fuel is being consumed, the material is just vanishing over time. And this is what happens if we have a look into the uh, microscope. Uh, initially, we have basically nothing. And as soon as I fuel my system, the tiny fibers start to grow, and these are forming the structure that allows to collapse the solid over there. What else we need with this kind of materials? We also thought that um, there is now like a huge problem with paper consuming because people is just using one paper for once, and then we don't need it anymore, we just throw it away. So we thought maybe we can also apply this temporary control of our materials for developing cell creation gates. So it would be cool if I just can use my paper once with an important information that I need for the next two hours, but when I don't need it anymore, it just vanishes and I can reuse the support again. So in this case, what we do was just um, put our blue building blocks in a supporting gel, we spray coat our fuel, and then, in this case, the logo of our university just appears. And because, again, the fuel is being consumed, my message is raised over the time. So the next morning, when I arrive to my office, my paper is basically clean again, and I can reuse it once and again and again. So, this is basically what I wanted to talk to you about today. I hope that you know now a little bit more about supramolecular chemistry, and also that you understand what beyond the molecule means, also important for me is if you also take the message that these structures are made out of supramolecular interactions and also of course how this uh, supramolecular chemistry could be a powerful tool to develop new and complex uh, materials, in our case with temporal control and also excitability properties. So thanks so much for your kind attention and please questions.